since the Cobb Douglas production function is so widely used in macroeconomic models, I devote this third part of the series on production functions, particularly to the Cobb Douglas production function, and repeat some of the things that we've already seen, but go more into the details of some other aspects. We start again with the constant elasticity of substitution production function, the CES production function, written down here, uh, where output is produced with physical capital and labor, and the elasticity of substitution between these two production factors is determined by rho. We already know from the previous videos, as rho tends to zero, we get the Cobb Douglas production function, that is then in this particular case, capital to the power of alpha and labor to the power of one minus alpha. So the elasticity of output with respect to capital input is equal to alpha, and the elasticity of output with respect to labor input is equal to one minus alpha. The elasticity of substitution between capital and labor in the Cobb Douglas case is one over one minus rho, and since rho is equal to zero, it is equal to one. So capital and labor can be substituted to a certain degree, and we usually have this case of uh, the Cobb Douglas production function that separates uh, two other cases, namely when capital and labor are gross substitutes, that is when the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is greater than one, or capital and labor being gross complements, that's when the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is smaller than one. So the Cobb Douglas case is the case that separates the two in which capital and labor can be substituted to a certain extent, but they are neither gross substitutes nor gross complements. The isoquants of the Cobb Douglas production function look like the one that I've uh, drawn here. Remember, the isoquant is basically uh, a collection of points along which I can produce the same output level with different combinations of capital and labor. Along this line, the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor is always equal to one. And this implies that for a high capital input and a low labor input, I can substitute quite a lot of capital with just a little bit more of labor input. And on the other hand here, if I have a lot of uh, employment already, but a low capital stock, I can increase the capital stock by just a little bit and substitute a lot of labor for um, uh, by this increase in capital. In terms of a two-dimensional illustration, we have uh, this figure here. So we have capital on the x-axis, labor on the y-axis, and output on the z-axis. And if I increase both production factors to the same extent, then I can increase output to the same extent as I increase the production factors. As we will see later on, this is a consequence of the production function uh, having constant returns to scale. But if I increase only one production factor, I can increase output, but the rate of increase decreases. So we have positive but diminishing uh, marginal product of both production factors. If I don't employ any labor, I cannot produce. If I don't employ any capital, I cannot uh, produce. And um, yeah, of course, at the origin, I also cannot produce anything. So if you again assume the perspective of holding one production factor constant, in this case labor, and increasing only the other one, we see this immediately graphically, that we uh, start at the origin with zero production, and the first unit of capital that we employ leads a lot of additional production, so the slope of the production function here at the origin is uh, tends to infinity, and then the slope decreases, and as capital increases further, and goes to infinity, we would have that the slope decreases to zero. So we will see on the next slide that actually the Cobb Douglas production function fulfills all the properties of a neoclassical production function. But to answer this question whether the Cobb Douglas production function is neoclassical, we now check the mathematical properties of a neoclassical production function. And from the corresponding videos, we already know that the first property is that the production function needs to have constant returns to scale with respect to the production inputs, in this case, capital and labor. So we can check it and take the Cobb Douglas production function, multiply capital by a certain amount lambda, multiply labor by the same amount lambda, and then we just reshuffle terms a little bit. So we see that we can uh, pull out lambda to the power of alpha from this term here, lambda to the power of one minus alpha from this term here. And if we multiply the two terms, we see that the exponents add, 
and we get lambda times k to the power of alpha l to the power of 1 minus alpha and that's nothing else than lambda times the production function which is lambda times output. So we see here that indeed if I multiply both production factors with a certain constant lambda then also output is multiplied by the constant lambda and mathematically the production function, the Cobb-Douglas production function therefore has constant returns to scale. What about the second property, the positive diminishing marginal product? So we again take the production function and take the derivatives of the production function with respect to labor and capital input. In the first case, we see that if we take the derivative with respect to labor, 1 minus alpha comes down from the exponent. The exponent is reduced by 1, so we have L to the power of minus alpha, and we have K to the power of alpha. We can reformulate this as 1 minus alpha times k divided by l to the power of alpha because l to the power of minus alpha is the same as 1 over l to the power of alpha. Now we see that with respect to labor, the marginal product declines. So as we employ more labor, it declines. And as we will see in the next property, it goes to zero as l goes to infinity. With respect to capital, if we take the derivative here, alpha comes down from the exponent and we have capital K to the power of alpha minus 1 and L to the power of 1 minus alpha remains unchanged because we take the derivative with respect to K. We can also reformulate this as alpha times L over K to the power of 1 minus alpha. Also here we see that this is diminishing in capital employment. So if capital increases, then the marginal product with respect to capital decreases and again as k goes to infinity we see we will see that this goes to zero. So this relates to the last of the three conditions that have to be fulfilled, the in other conditions. As L goes to infinity, the marginal product would have to go to zero. We see that this is the case here. So if you increase L, obviously this decreases and goes to zero as L tends to infinity. Now, what happens if L tends to zero? Well, then we see that this tends to infinity because if L decreases, the denominator decreases and if it goes to zero, then this term here increases and uh, goes to infinity. What about the marginal product with respect to capital? Well, here we see the same. So if K goes to infinity, the marginal product goes to zero and if K goes to zero, the marginal product goes to infinity. So altogether, we see that all three conditions for a neoclassical production function are fulfilled in the Cobb-Douglas case, so the Cobb-Douglas production function is a neoclassical production function. Next, we would like to know what the factor rewards are in the Cobb-Douglas case. So the factor rewards are the compensation for the production factors, so the wage rate in case of labor and the capital rental rate in case of capital and the capital rental rate is typically the interest rate plus the rate of depreciation because the costs of capital consist of two parts the payments that I have to make to those who rent me uh, their capital and the capital that I use in production bears out and that's uh, the depreciation of capital. Now in case of perfect competition economic models would predict that the factor rewards are given by the marginal value product of the production factor under consideration. Now this is intuitively clear. If you have a firm and you employ physical capital and labor, then you would employ a capital up to the point where the last unit of capital that you employ exactly earns its cost. And the same holds true with respect to the production factor labor. You would hire workers as long as each additional worker increases revenue by more than the cost of the additional worker, such that profits increase. And in the end, the last unit of capital that you employ, the last unit of labor you employ as a profit-maximizing firm, would earn exactly their respective cost, which is in case of the capital stock, the capital rental rate, and in case of labor, it's the wage rate. For more detailed information on this, I would recommend the video on profit maximization. But here we just take this as given and say, okay, the wage rate will be equal to 
the marginal product of the production factor labor and the capital rental rate consisting of the interest rate and the rate of depreciation will be equal to the marginal product of the production factor capital in a model with perfect competition. In a model with imperfect competition of course things look a bit uh, different because there is market power involved and it's not necessarily the case that at the equilibrium uh, all production factors are compensated by their marginal product. But if we are in the case of perfect competition, then we will have this situation here. And we've computed the marginal product already on the previous slide when we checked the uh, conditions for a neoclassical production function, where we've seen that the derivative of the production function with respect to labor is equal to 1 minus alpha times k over l to the power of alpha. We can rewrite this actually as 1 minus alpha times the production function itself divided by l, which you can easily check. And with respect to the capital rental rate, it's the same. It's the derivative of the production function with respect to capital. We've computed on the previous slide that this is alpha times L over K to the power of 1 minus alpha. And again, we can rewrite this as alpha times the production function divided by the amount of capital employed. So what we see here is that the wage rate in the economy decreases with employment which is intuitively clear because if you have more workers in the economy, then there is more competition among them, so to say, and therefore this would bid wages down in the end. So if we have more workers for a constant capital stock, then wages would decrease because the marginal product of labor decreases. By contrast, if the capital stock increases and labor stays constant, the wage rate would go up. And the intuition for this is again clear, so you have more assembly lines, more demand for labor, but only a constant labor force, so firms would pay higher wages to hire the um, workers that they want to have, and the wage rate would increase. The reason is that the marginal product of workers goes up in this case. And with respect to capital, it's exactly uh, the other way around. So if um, we have the capital rental rate here and the capital stock increases, then the capital rental rate goes down because capital becomes more abundant, the marginal product of capital decreases and therefore its compensation would go down. By contrast, if there are more workers in the economy for a constant capital stock, the marginal product of capital will increase and so the capital rental rate would increase. And the fundamental reason for all of that is the diminishing marginal product of the, all the production factors in case of the Copangless production function. Finally, I'd like to say something on the factor income shares in an economy if the economy is described by a Copangless production function and we have perfect competition. Now, in this case, we can compute the labor income share by definition as the wage rate multiplied by the number of workers, then we would have the total wage bill in the economy divided by GDP. So that would be the share of total income in the economy that goes to the production factor labor. Now we can plug in the wage rate that we've derived on the previous slide, which was 1 minus alpha times the GDP of a country, total output divided by employment. And then we have to multiply by employment over GDP. And we see immediately that this term here cancels out. And what we are left with is 1 minus alpha. So the share of wage income in an economy, of labor income in an economy, is constant and equal to 1 minus alpha. What about the capital income share? This is correspondingly given by the rate of return on capital multiplied by the total capital stock. So that would be total capital income. And we again divide by GDP, or total output, the value of total output, which is the same. So we plug in from the previous slide again the expression that we had for the rate of return on capital, which was alpha multiplied by y over k. And we see here we have to multiply this by k over y to get the share of capital income. And again, this drops out and this is equal to alpha. So it is constant. So the bottom line here is that factor income shares are constant in case of a Cobb-Douglas production function and with perfect competition. As I said before, with imperfect competition, it may look differently, but most basic macroeconomic models assume perfect competition and many of them employ a Cobb-Douglas production function. For example, the famous solo growth model with which we deal in other videos extensively. 
The good thing is that this actually fits to the stylized facts of uh, economic growth, to Calder's stylized facts to be precise. And Nicholas Calder stated that over the uh, most of the 19th and first half of the 20th century, the capital income share stayed constant. And actually, this is what we see in the data, at least until the 1980s. You can see this in the chapter uh, related to the stylized facts on economic uh, growth. However, since the 1980s, this is not anymore the case. The capital income share increased and the labor income share decreased in many countries. And uh, economists have put forward many different explanations for that. And one prominent explanation is that automation can actually um, be put forward as a factor that drives the increase in the capital income share and the decrease in the labor income share. Because automation is mainly what we observe since the 1980s. Before that, the number of industrial robots worldwide was negligible. Only since then, it's uh, increasing. And since uh, robots are a substitute for workers, but the income that robots earn goes to the capital owners, to the owners of the robot, this can basically, this new dynamic can explain why the labor income share might have gone down and the capital income share increased.